Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Candidate Forum, sponsored by the American Association of University Women, dedicated to empowering the lives of women and girls. Tonight's moderator is Emily Verbinski. Emily is currently serving as the membership chair for the League of Women Voters of Sheboygan County. Originally from Metro Detroit, she has lived in Sheboygan for nearly three years, working as a polymer engineer for Seiko AEI Polymers. She is joining us today because of her passion for voter access and voter education in the community. Please welcome Emily. Okay, so we're gonna start um, with introductions by, from each candidate. Um, so we can start with Betty, if you have your introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Betty Ackley. I am the District can Four, oh, sorry, sure. Hello, my name is Betty Ackley. I'm the District Four Alder Person. I joined Common Council in March of 2019. Um, I am here representing my neighbors, and I am hoping that I can continue to do so as we move into the next two years. Um, I am really excited to be here, so thank you. Um, and uh, Betty is running against Deborah Yokus, um, and she is not here today. Um, so next we'll let Dean introduce himself. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hi. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the American Association of University Women for hosting this forum. I'd also like to thank those in attendance and those watching at home. Uh, my name is Dean Decker. I am married to my wife, Deborah, and I have a three, three grown children, two sons and a daughter. I'm a lifelong resident of Sheboygan, and I am employed as the head custodian of James Madison Elementary School. I'm the cur current older person for the 6th District, and, I, and in that role, I serve as the committee of the whole chair chairperson, being humbly elected by my peers. Uh, I am the, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm sorry. It may, it, it, get a little closer here there. How's this? Better? You hear? Okay. Okay. Uh, I am the chairman of the Public Works Committee and serve on the Law and Licensing and P Public Hearings, Marina Parks and Forestry, and the Transits Committee. I also serve as president of the Indiana Corridor Neighborhood Association, and I'm a past president of the Sheboygan Area School District Support, Support Staff Union. I'm running because I like to be a part of the decision-making process of our city government and enjoy serving my community. I feel my experience and leadership make me the best candidate for this position. I've been attentive to the needs of the residents of the 6th District and I'm a lifelong and I have respect for the history of the city while balancing the needs for, for change when necessary. Some of the things that have occurred during my tenure, the remodeling of this city hall right here, the, the space, um, several streets, including Georgia Avenue, Union Avenue, North Avenue, Superior Avenue, sections of Taylor Drive, the Oscar Apartments, the Kingsbury development, and the, the uh, acquisition of the building that the Senior Center will be, hold, be May, um, be in. We just recently uh, broke ground for the remodeling of that on Monday, and uh, I look forward to uh, serving this district. Um, and Dean is running against Mark Herman, um, who is also not here today. So next we'll have Andre introduce himself. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to start by thanking the AAUW for hosting this forum and inviting all the candidates to participate. It is so important to have a nonpartisan it is so important to have nonpartisan forums during this nonpartisan elections. Citizens need to have a good opportunity to learn the real facts about candidates before the election. Sheboygan is an amazing city. Since moving to Sheboygan, I have quickly found that this city has so much to offer. It's a great place to raise a family. The lake shore is amazing, and the people are some of the nicest that you'll meet in the Midwest. The, these are the reasons that I've fallen in love with the city of Sheboygan. And when you love something, it takes care and passion to ensure the future of it. My love for Sheboygan is what, what got me involved. I bring a fresh new perspective to the city council. 
I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater with a degree in business management. I'm the executive director of Wisconsin Nonprofit. I currently serve on the Public Works Committee, Me Public Library, Me Public Library Board, and Housing Rehabilitation Com Committee. All of these experiences have taught me the importance of working with others to get things done. Working with communities and boards isn't always an easy task, but I have always found the best way to bring everyone together is to focus on shared goals. I, I know this city is special, but in order to sustain this city, more young people like myself need to choose to stay and move to this city to ensure its future. The city's population has slightly increased over the years, over the past few years. However, it is not enough to have a tangible effect on the city's budget. Right now, we are struggling to deal with a housing shortage. We must understand not tackling this issue can lead to disruptions in the labor pool, city services, road funding, and overall health and safety of the city. Taking a proactive stance to address these issues is how we'll continue to strengthen the city of Sheboygan. I am happy to say as soon as I was appointed to the council seat, I hit the ground running. I met with the department heads to get a clear understanding of the challenges we face and immediately took action. One of my first committee votes was to approve the enterprise asset management system, which will help us more efficiently tend to our road, road maintenance. Making improvements, like this is the, making improvements like this will help improve city services while also saving taxpayer money down the road. Going back to the old ways of thinking will only stunt the progress we are making. There have been too many past, past years where previous councils neglected our roads as a result cars and safeties, cars and our safety are paying the, those mistakes to this day. I know Sheboygan is ready for a fresh new perspective, a perspective that offers solutions to, problems, to the problems that we face. We cannot keep, keep kicking the problems down the road for the future councils to solve. The time for action is now. I hope at the end of this forum that I will have the, the people of the 10th District's vote. Thank you. Um, and Andre's opponent is Joseph Heidemann, who also couldn't be here, but he did prepare a statement that I'm going to read. Um, good evening. I am Joe Heidemann, and I'm running for alderman in the 10th District. I am a veteran of the United States Air Force, a family man, and I am a Christian. I have a lot of experience in city government in both Sheboygan and Sheboygan Falls. This experience provides me with a good background in decision-making, ensuring the residents of the 10th District that I have qualifications necessary to be on the Common Council. Why should experience mean so much to the taxpayers in this district? Currently, I feel the council is being directed by outside sources rather than being encouraged to reason together as an elected group and share independent viewpoints. Prior to, making, to, prior to moving to Sheboygan, I served as alderman and also as mayor of Sheboygan Falls. In Sheboygan as alderman, I served under four mayors, Juan Perez, Bob Ryan, Terry Van Akron, and Mike Vandersteen. I've been appointed to positions on every standing committee within city government many times as chairman or vice chair. I was also elected by my fellow councilmen to vice chairman of the common council and committee of the whole chairman. These added responsibilities increased the workload that I very willingly made and would again make the extra effort for the good of our citizens. I have the ability to communicate with both individual department heads and council members. I believe good communication enabled many projects that were in the best interest of my district and this city to be completed. One such project was the passage of an ordinance to deal with sex offenders. The state was placing these individuals within the city without proper notification and with little regard to child safety. The ordinance was passed. That was the first step. The second was to implement. Um, the Public Protection and Safety Committee held that responsibility. I was part of that committee along with Alderman Mike Hanna. Implementation was difficult at times because no situation was ever the same. We were successful because we could share ideas and we agreed that our utmost concern was protecting the children of Sheboygan. This was done in every case. I was also on the committee to explore the city administrator position along with individual citizens not on the council. This was well, a well thought out process. We wanted what was best for the city of Sheboygan, not merely a replica of what other communities had done. This also took communication and respect for every opinion on the committee. The work put in by the committee helped that common council establish the position. An ambulance service was put in place while I was on the council. This was to be part of the fire department. I did my research. I contacted individuals within the district for opinions and weighed them carefully. The service has been a success. 
I have been part of many of the city's recent developments. These projects don't get done without a lot of discussion and study. Current staffing on both the fire and police departments are a foremost concern of mine. Public safety of the citizens of Sheboygan is a top priority. We are currently in a building surge, which means the added responsibilities for these two departments needs to be addressed. I will work to make sure that not only those offices, but all departments within the city are adequately staffed. The continuous repair of streets and infrastructure will also be a major concern. For many years on the Public Works Committee, many years on the Public Works Committee has prepared me for addressing those areas. The creation of parks for both individuals living in our developments along with their pets is a must. The maintaining of our number one asset, our lovely lakeshore, is something I seek to achieve. There is little that I haven't done or wouldn't do to help Sheboygan thrive. I have served on the Transit Commission and the Senior Center Commission. These services and the quality of these services are, is important to me. The lights need to stay on, garbage needs to be picked up, streets plowed, sewer and water service should be second to none. Police and fire protection should be more than just adequate. Good services will attract good businesses with the potential to help Sheboygan grow. These are what the concerns of the local government should mainly be about. I can assure the citizens of the 10th district that they will be represented by, well represented by Joe Heideman. Okay, um, and now we'll move on to the questions. Um, I'm gonna go mix up the order so no one has to be first every time. Um, so here we go. Uh, the first question is, why are you running for city council and what is one of the best contributions that you will bring to the council? And we'll start with Betty on this one. Okay, so I am running because I would like to continue to represent my, oh, sorry, I keep doing that. I would, I'm sorry about leaving my mask on. Um, I would like to continue to represent the neighbors in my district. I feel like uh, my background in finance and human resources allows me the opportunity to make some positive decisions. Um, we are facing a housing crisis here. Um, these are issues that I've had experience with um, over the past three years serving as the elder person here. Um, I feel like I listen to my constituents. I listen to everybody's concerns. No matter how big or small the issue might be, if I can't resolve that problem or I can't give them the answers that they're looking for, I will find the person that is responsible within the city that can do so. So, you know, the, but the real reason why I'm running is I feel like I need to contribute to our community. I need to continue to be active and I need to be continuing to help my neighbors in any way that I can. So that is my purpose for running. And I do believe that I am a good candidate, not only from my experience, but some of the things that we have done as a council. Um, I feel like um, I can continue to do so um, in any way that people need me. So I like to listen to what the constituents have to say. I feel like if I am making decisions that are supposed to be best for the city, the only way that I can do that is by having residents tell me what their opinion is because I think it's important that we come as a group collective and we are all responsible for this wonderful city we live in. So that is why I feel like I want to be the representative of the people and not be making decisions for myself personally. This is a nonpartisan position and I have always respectfully kept it as such. So thank you. Okay, and next we'll have Dean. Okay, uh, why am I running? Um, I always like to, I like to serve the community. I, I like to serve the community that, I've, that I'm in. I, I, I feel I've done a good job uh, in the past doing serving the community. Uh, I actually, um, I, I, public service has been kind of part of my life for quite a long time I, as being a custodian in, in the Sheboygan Area School District. Uh, it's also serving the community. Um, I think that uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 what I bring to the table to this is um, my leadership. I've been uh, the leader of the uh, Committee of the Whole. Uh, I bring a lot of experience to public works. Um, I'm very familiar with how a lot of the things go work, work, go through down there. Uh, um, I bring uh, a, uh, a a passion that uh, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, 
I guess that's the model I have right now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So. Um, and then Andre. Thank you. Yeah, so first and foremost, um, I love this city and I love the, the district that I live in. Um, as a person who loves their community, I've always sought ways to impact the community, improve where I see needed. Um, this, is, this is why I got involved in local government, but I'm running for this seat because I believe we need someone to uplift the voices of all the people of the detention district. If you've ever been to the 10th district, we have a very, very diverse community. Uh, there's homeowners, there's renters, and then there's a growing minority population. I believe the person who takes, who gets this seat should be able to uplift all the voices of the 10th district and not just those, uh, not just one segment of the, of the district. Um, so for me, it's about uplifting every, everyone's voice, whether they're homeowners or renters. Um, and it's clear from knocking on doors that people want a very proactive older person. I'm not sitting around waiting on people to come to me. I'm going to doors, I'm knocking doors, and I'm having genuine conversations. And from those, those conversations, they like to see somebody young and proactive uh, seeking out their voices. Um, I've, I've knocked on some doors where people haven't seen the older in, in years. Um, so I'm changing that up and actually going to constituents and, and getting their uh, concerns reflected to the city council. So I bring that to the table. Um, but yeah, I, I believe I'm ready for the job. Uh, I have the experience uh, with my, my nonprofit work and also my work on the Mead Public Library Board gives me the right experience to step right into this, continue in this role. Um, and I hope to have the 10th District's vote as a result. So thank you. Okay, and our next question is, what are the three most important challenges facing City Council? And we'll start with the Dean on this one. The three most, uh, what was it, excuse the me? The three most important challenges facing city council. The three most important challenges facing city uh, I would say um, we've got the three most important challenges that are currently uh, housing, uh, affordable housing, and that's one of the, probably, that, that's the number one key right now. I think uh, that's one of the uh, largest issues we have um, to, we, we need the housing for, to attract uh, young People coming to this area to attract for, for, for the industry, bringing through. Uh, there's a tr tremendous labor shortage at this time, and uh, without having that, we we're, we're we're behind the eight ball on that. Um, the other thing I would say that's uh, another challenge that's coming up is uh, replacing revenue from the uh, closing of the uh, Alliant Power Plant. Uh, that's a, we're, we're, they've already cl closed uh, shut down Unit Four. Uh, which was a significant uh, decrease in revenue for for the city from that, and uh, now they've now they're going to be shutting down Unit Five in the next uh, year. Uh, when that when those things occur, that's it. we have, we have to find ways to replace that revenue. I think well, part of that challenge would be to uh, bring bring it, which actually would be a the third portion is is bringing industry into this uh, city. We have a tremendous. Uh, Industrial Park now, our, our our business center that we just re, uh, we just per, um, built, and um, I think uh, finding and retaining businesses for that is a, another big challenge that we need to uh, we need to address and we, we need to work on. Um, also, I guess another thing that we is continuing to work on our roads. I mean, that's that's if you ask any constituent, that's one of their biggest concerns is roads, and uh, I need I think we. We've got a good program going on, uh, as we, we just, as Andre uh, alluded to, that we uh, we have a new uh, um, program we're implementing to uh, help us address, uh, kind of keep things so that we're doing it financially and fiscally responsibly, but we're able to keep on with those uh, with that. Thing. So, I guess that's about all I have right now. That. And next, we'll have Andre. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm definitely in agreement with Alder Decker on those issues that we face. Um, I'll just add a few things to that. So one of the biggest challenges we face and probably will always face is the budget. So while we've done a good job at balancing the budget, uh, we continue to face reductions in shared revenue from the state. Since 2018, we've seen a reduction of nearly $800,000 uh, from, from Madison. This makes it more difficult to provide essential services to the city citizens. Um, so that's gonna be a huge issue that we have to have uh, alders that are ready to tackle that issue. Um, we also, like many other cities, we are facing a worker shortage. There are a number of reasons why the city and many businesses are facing this issue, but it stems from before the pandemic. Um, but in order to address the worker shortage issue at its core, I believe we must address a few things, and it stems, um, 
with, with addressing our ongoing child care crisis. Um, there are over 300 uh, parents who have children on waiting lists, and this is an issue that um, has to go in, to be addressed in correlation with the worker shortage. Um, and we also have to continue to address affordable housing. Uh, obviously, that's in direct correlation with how, how workers are going to come to the city, whether they're going to be able to live in the city. So that's going to directly tie into the worker shortage. Um, I also believe we have to have a council that is focused on solutions today for a better tomorrow. We've had councils that have, have not invested in the city, which is why we've had so many crumbling roads today. More recent councils have understood their responsibility to maintain our roads. So again, I'm in agreement with Alder Decker, but uh, the roads are obviously the, the biggest issue that taxpayers want to see addressed. Um, so balancing the budget and while also making sure we attain our roads are, are the most important. And Betty. Okay, so something that I have done is I have focused on speaking with constituents, trying to find out, you know, some of our biggest issues. And I will echo Alder Decker and Alder Walton in saying that we definitely have a affordable housing crisis here. Um, we have families that are really struggling to find safe places and having landlords that will repair their properties and keep it safe for their families. So to me, I think that's something that's very important is locating a way to provide affordable housing, especially with families. Um, one of the other issues that we have is attracting businesses here. When our kids are growing up, they're graduating from high school and they're going somewhere else because there's nothing great to keep them here. So I am hopeful that we can continue to be a place that is attractive to business. I think that you know it's very important that we find businesses that are not going to wreck our environment, but businesses that will bring good jobs here so that our kids, instead of moving away to a bigger city or better opportunities, will actually choose to stay in Sheboygan. Um, another issue that I've been hearing quite a bit from people is their concerns about loose dogs and dog biting and some problems with pets. And as the chairperson of the mayor's pet friendly task group, um, <clears throat> this has come to my attention. We've got to do something because people feel like this is an out of control issue. It doesn't affect everybody, but it does affect us as a community. We cannot have a bad reputation as being a terrible place to live. So all of these smaller issues that may not seem hugely important to me are still very important. So I'm trying to make sure that I keep a well-rounded view of all of our problems and hopefully we can attract business here, have a safe place for families to live, great places to work, all while being fiscally responsible. Thanks. All right. So question three is, what do you envision as the most appropriate development of the former armory site? Um, and we'll start with Andre on this one. Yeah, I think um, the armory was a good good thing that we had here for a long time. But um, there have been a number of suggestions that I've heard about that we can use it uh, to repurpose something that's useful. So, for example, we've used uh, some ARPA funds to redevelop the old Save-A-Lot building. Um, to make the, or to renovate it into the new senior center, which is also known as Uptown Social. So I think we have to have a conversation with our department here, it's, uh, our department heads, the mayor, and see what would best benefit the community uh, as a whole. Um, as of right now, I'm not exactly sure what we should put there, but I think we should have an ongoing conversation, similar to what we had with uh, repurposing the, the old Save-A-Lot building. building. Um, and Betty? I'm going to echo what um, Alder Walton said here. Um, so I think that it's very important that we think about the future and future generations. We can't just be selfish and think of ourselves. So we definitely need to have a communication you know, with the mayor's office, with the department heads, and figure out what is the best way to develop that property so that it benefits all residents, um, not just a select few. Um, I think that there are plenty of wonderful ideas. I know that the armory is a very contentious issue and everybody was quite upset to lose something so important to the community. So what we need to do is we need to find something else that we can create there that would be a space for people to feel a strong attachment to. What that is, I don't know yet, um, but I think that it's definitely a conversation that we need to continue to have to figure out what is going to be best for everyone, not just us, but also future generations. Indeed. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I also echo what Betty and Andre said about it, 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 the working together to, to, to find the best fit. I mean, um, personally, I've thought about this a little bit with different things. I, 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 I would like to possibly see something like a hotel, a restaurant, um, community type of thing where, where we, people can do, you know, but that, that was one of the uh, original um, thoughts when the Armory itself existed. Uh, something where I think that's going to be attract, that's going to attract people to Sheboygan, for, you know, uh, take advantage of the um, you know, iconic view from there, the, the lakefront and everything like that. Uh, I think that it, it should still also be that where the community members will be. So, like a restaurant or something that would be, you know, in, incorporated with. That's a thought. I mean, that's just. I mean, I'm I'm open to all all different ideas, um, and I'm, I'm, I look forward to he to hearing uh, suggestions in the future. All right, question four. The city is increasingly diverse ethnically, religiously, and in gender, and in many other ways. We see this reflected in our neighborhoods and school classrooms, but it is not yet reflected in government and civic leadership positions. How would you include and encourage citizens from these groups to serve on committees and participate in city government? Um, and we'll start with Betty on this one. Okay, so that is something that I have done. Um, I have asked friends to please, please, please get involved. Local government is not a very difficult task, and we do need to have opinions from everyone. Um, so I felt like, you know, when getting out into the community and speaking with friends and trying to encourage others, um, I think that diversity is extremely important. I think it comes through education. Uh, my involvement with um, different groups and also being a person of color myself, most people don't realize that, that I am half Japanese. Um, I feel like it's very important that everybody be represented in this community. Um, I'm appreciative of everybody that sits on the council or has done so previously, um, but I think that it's very important that we encourage people, um, get out in the community and talk to them you know, make friends with people. It's not that hard to get people to become involved. You just have to show them that what they are doing is making a change for the future. So I think part of it is education, part of it is communication. We've really got to communicate. And especially with the younger folks, we have to get them interested in becoming involved. And they need to see faces that are reflective of themselves in order to feel like they have a chance to have a voice. So. Great, and um, next we'll have Andre. Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Um, something I continue to think about. So I think um, what, what's great about Sheboygan is we um, have a very, very growing diverse population in communities. Uh, there are over 40 lang different languages spoken in our schools, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Uh, but first, I think we have to start by building a sense of trust with the under underrepresented communities. Um, uh, yeah, we have to recognize that that Underserved communities or minority populations have a, a, a dis, distrust in government for a various amount of reasons. So I think we have to start by having communications with these communities and understand where they come from, their, their ethnic uh, beliefs. And I think once you start to build that trust, you can start having the transition of getting them involved to local government and understanding what, what we do and how what purpose we serve. Um, so I think it starts with communication and then we can move on to including them into our government programs and and institutions. So um, as a person of color myself, um, I have felt very involved and very invited by the people. Uh, it just it just takes um, communication, and that's where I think we have to start. And Dean? I guess I'd have to echo what uh, Andre and uh, Betty have both said. I mean, uh, I think that it, it, it does start with educational, too. I mean, working with people and, 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 and working with the schools, bringing some of the things like that. I'm bringing, bringing the young people into it so that you do bring uh, uh, the diversity in. Um, I will say one thing, that this council is, is a great representation of it. This is probably the most diverse council you know that there ever has been, and I'm proud to be part of this. I mean, it, it, it's we've got age. I mean, I, um, the, the, the uh, we've got all ethnicities, ages, everything. I, I think in this the, that the fact that we have this great diversity in this council, I think, is a great um, um, reflection of our community. And I think it, it, that just this this itself 
uh, it helps encourage people to, because they can look up at the council and say, hey, I, I, look at that, look, there, there's, there's uh, someone that, that looks like me up on that council. So uh, I, I do think that the one population that probably is bit, has been underrepresented and I would like to see encouraged more is the Hmong population. Uh, I, um, I don't believe, I, I think on the school board there was one Hmong, Hmong gentleman, but I think I would like to see more of that. The, uh, their population be represented, they're, they're, they're a vital part of our community. And uh, I think that that's, but I, but I am very happy to see some of the, um, uh, what, what's going on in the city right now. And I hope we can continue it. Okay, our next question, um, Milwaukee, West Bend, Racine, and Kaukauna, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, are offering incentives to city employees if they live in the city. Would you support this plan for Sheboygan? And we'll start with Dean on this one. Oh, this is a tough one. Um, I, they're offering incentives to state to, for people to live in the city rather than you know, for their employees to live in the city or for, I'm sorry. Um, it says city employees. For city employees. Um, I didn't write the question. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, I, uh, I'm not really sure if I, I've ever really studied this on that at all. Um, I don't know if I would be necessarily in favor of that. Uh, I guess I would have to learn more about it and see once what, what kind of effect it would have on our budgets. Um, that's the, always the biggest thing is the budget. How do you do, uh, how do you, uh, uh, Bring through a program like that without and affecting things like that. Um, how do you uh, address the people that are already currently living in the city? I mean, how that, you know, that, that are already public employees. Um, so uh, I guess that's uh, I kind of have to punt on this one a little bit. I guess. <laughs> uh, we'll go to Betty next on this one. I'm going to say the same thing. I think that's a really tough question to answer uh, because obviously uh, the city has finite revenue streams and we have to be fiscally responsible with what we have, although it would be very attractive to um, ask people to live here. I feel like I am not experienced in that area. I would have to look at the research. I would be interested in seeing how that would work um, in a city of our size. Um, although it would be very nice to do so, I, I really think we'd have to do our homework because we have to ensure that we are fiscally responsible with the funding that we receive and with you know federal and state funding getting smaller and smaller. You know, the concern would be how are we supposed to budget this? How are we supposed to balance things and ensure that we are providing citizens with the services that they need and deserve? So if we're cutting more into resources, who is going to pay that? Because it, even though the taxpayers have to pay, it is unfair to continue to raise taxes consistently because we want to do more things. So I think it would be something that we would all have to sit down and really do our homework before making such a comment like that or a decision like that. Um, I think we would have to have some definite research about where we would bring in funding from. And Andre? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a very interesting idea, and I'm, I'm definitely willing to learn more about it. But um, so the, we have to take in some of the realities of the city. We have over 3,000 uh, positions unfilled in, in, in Sheboygan. So obviously the, the job market is extremely competitive. Um, but we have a severe worker shortage in the city of Sheboygan. So I wouldn't want to discriminate against any talented workers that currently live outside the city limits. Um, adding to this issue is that we would have, obviously we have a, um, a shortage of affordable housing. Uh, so that also makes it a lot more competitive to deal with. Um, so we need to address the affordable housing issue first, and then we can discuss if it's necessary to even have incentives for employees to live in the city. So I think we have to take in some of the, the, the factors that go into you know, our, our needs right now. Because if, if we say, you know, you have to live in the city and then you get these incentives, then we're kind of discouraging some people who might be extremely talented for the positions we're looking to fill, uh, and they might actually turn away and look for a different job in another city. Um, so currently right now, um, I would have to learn more about it to see how that would even work out. But um, yeah, I would, I would say uh, I'm not fully on board with it right now. Um, so our next question, how can we maintain safe neighborhoods? And we'll start with Andre on this one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I actually wrote this down. 
So, um, and I think in order to maintain uh, safety in our neighborhoods, we have to take a multi-tiered approach. Um, so I, I expressed this in my first, one of my first votes on the council, uh, which was to increase the, the funding for the police budget, uh, which demonstrates my strong support for public safety. So it's a given that we, that we must have a strong police department in the city. Uh, but as, as I think we also have to go a little bit further in helping our police department out. So as members of the community, we all need to work together to ensure the safety of our neighborhoods. Uh, we need better services for people struggling with mental health addictions and uh, homelessness, and uh, many of the challenges tend to lead to crime. That tend to lead to crime uh, can be addressed by the city uh, before the crime actually even happens. Um, our police department, uh, while I think they're doing a great job, can't do it alone, and uh, I think they need all of us to play our part in ensuring the safety of the city. Um, and I think that can range in a, in a number of ways that we can help out from locking up our personal properties to installing security cameras around our homes and also uh, working with the county uh, to get more services for pe services that people need. I know one of the pilot programs that we're working on is having mental health um, workers drive along with police officers. And I think that's an amazing idea that we can explore. Um, but overall, I think the best way to keep our neighborhoods safe uh, revolves around our police department and citizens working together to create and maintain our city neighborhoods. And Dean. Uh, I think what, what we, one of the things that we need to uh, address for to maintain safe neighborhoods, we, we have to look at a, a, a multi-tier approach to, to this. I mean, uh, lighting. Um, uh, neighborhood associations, which we you know currently are doing now, I think those are very helpful. I mean, being being on one, I know how that it does work. It, it helps to bring the neighbors together. I mean, it makes it brings you know it, it brings that sense of community. They're worried about more. You know, if you know if you know your neighbor, you care about your neighbor more. I mean, I, it just it just comes down to that. Uh, I think that uh, the neighborhood officers, having the neighborhood officers that we have now, I think the more more, uh, more of that, so that the people get to know the police officers, they get to know them personally, the officers get to know the people in the neighborhood personally, uh, that they can um, get to you know, know, know them and that when there is problems, they, they feel comfortable reporting those problems and bringing those problems forward and coming, to, coming in, uh, Bringing solutions to those problems, helping them through that. Um, I, I think that you, you need to. Uh, people need to be uh, bring bring pride to the neighborhood. Uh, uh, work work through the different uh, areas, and uh, I think that's about my answer on that. And Betty. So one of the things that I think is super important is that. As neighbors, we need to get out of our houses. We need to get off of our properties. We need to go meet our neighbors and get to know people. That way, you have a, an ability to know who's living on your block, who's living across the street, who lives a little bit away. If people are communicating with one another and they're getting to know each other when there is a problem, hopefully somebody has eyes on their property. If it's a problem with the neighbor, um, you know, if you have a problem with your neighbor, rather than calling the police right away, Try and talk to your neighbor and work it out. I think that, you know, having that communication between neighbors is very helpful to keep what feels like a safe and secure neighborhood. Obviously, um, the police department has been an integral part of that. Um, I think that the city developing the neighborhood associations has been a great thing for neighbors to get out to meet each other. Um, breaking the ice can be super awkward. I know when I moved into my neighborhood, nobody talked on my block. And the first thing I did was I tried to find catch people outside and start talking to them because getting to know people, you feel a sense of responsibility that you need to take care of your neighbors, you need to watch out for your neighbors. So to build a secure neighborhood, it's, it's a relationship between the police department and the residents. We all have to work together as a team and we need to come up with ideas to keep our neighborhoods safe. And you know, just because we had the neighborhood associations and that's a great place to meet people, sometimes those associations aren't active. So we have to find a way to educate people, to teach them that we have these fantastic opportunities. Um, I think that having the police um, come into schools and, and help these children learn that they, they are a safe place to go. They're great people to talk to. There are ways to get help. Um, I think that it's really also educational because we need to um, take care of each other and we also need to rely on ourselves and the police working in a having a good working relationship 
um, to keep our neighborhoods safe, but we really, we are responsible for watching out for one another and trying to take care of each other. All right, our next question. What ideas do you have for bringing more people and businesses to the downtown? How would you revitalize downtown Sheboygan? Um, and we'll start with Betty. So I know that we've always relied on tourism. That's a great way to bring people in here. Um, I think that one of the more unique things that we have to do is we have to consider that there are all types of businesses. I know that when I was on uh, the licensing hearings and public safety committee, we had the ax bar coming into town and everybody thought, oh my gosh, that sounds dangerous, drinking and throwing axes, oh boy. But it's not, it's a really popular activity in Milwaukee and so we had to take a chance on doing something new to bring something fun and different to the community. And I think that if we attract new things, we will attract more visitors here, we will attract more folks that want to live here and spend more time here. Um, I think that we really, we need to invest in downtown and find ways that we can bring businesses here that are attractive and unique, that are more unique to Sheboygan, bring some interesting things here for people to enjoy. And Dean? Yes, uh, I, I agree with Betty on, on that. I, um, I think that you know, we, we, we've got some really good uh, core things that are down there now. There's been some great um, great additions in the last couple of years. Um, the, the game board has a new facility down there that they, or they actually were not new, they, they repurposed a beautiful building and it, it's great. Uh, there's been a few other um, places that have just recently, uh, the, the Three Turtles uh, shop in there. Uh, I think places like that, I think that we have to be open to new and great, better ideas for that. I think we need to and encourage um, uh, businesses to, to bring through. Uh, I think that the, the, again, the tourism also, the tourism aspect of we can bring people in that the things that are going to be th that unique uh, variety of, of, of ideas. Um, I'm always open to the different things and I think that uh, we have to keep, you know, continue to, to go in that direction. And Andre. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think there's a couple of steps that we've already taken to revitalize our downtown. So I know we have gotten those electric scooters that not everyone likes, but I think it, it was something that really sparked some of the, the energy of downtown. Uh, I see more people down by the lake shore uh, riding the scooters. So that's exciting. Uh, so that also sparks business. So if people are more, or if more people are spending time downtown, then obviously they're gonna spend more money um, more money in, in the local areas around there. So I think we have to explore all the options that can bring more business downtown, um, but also just explore uh, business ventures and opportunities. I, I know this is something I've talked with about a few people. I, I think we really need a Dave and Buster's. I really like Dave and Buster's. So if we can get that here, I would. I think that would bring a lot of business downtown. But uh, yeah, I think we just have to continue to explore the options that are available to us to make the, the downtown exciting, uh, make it more vibrant. Um, and continue to work with business developers uh, to ensure that they'll they'll have business when they come here. How can the city repurpose the big box buildings that have been empty for years, such as the pick and save buildings on Calumet and South Business Drive? And we'll start with Dean on this one. Uh, the big box buildings. Um, well, uh, it's it's a, a multi-tiered approach again. Also, uh, the, the pick and save building um, is uh, right now currently um, it's owned by a, uh, a separate entity, uh, and pick and save is still paying the the rent on that. So it's it's difficult to get anybody to move on that. You can't just say, well, you have to leave. They're going to. But um, I'm I'm I'd like to see different businesses in these places. Um, some of the sometimes some of the buildings can be repurposed. Like we we like we the city have repurposed the uh, the uh, old save a lot into now what we're going to be uptown social, which is I think a, you know a, a, a great asset, going to be a great asset for the city. Uh, we need to look for other adventures like that, uh, or other things that we can put into those those and. Uh, Try to find different things. It, you know, some of them are limited. Sometimes some of them have to be taken down. I mean, uh, it, it, it should not be allowed to 
deteriorate in front of our eyes. That's one thing that I am, you know, against the having the, just letting these buildings sit and, and deteriorate in front of our eyes. I know there's been a lot of issues with that pick and save building as far as seagulls and things like that, and we have to um, continue to uh, put pressure on the owners that that are there so that 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 we you know that they do maintain those buildings at least until they that we do find a repurpose for them. And uh, I think we need to uh, continue to uh, just be open to open to different ideas on those things. Andre? Yeah, yeah. I think um, one of the things that we recently did that uh, Alder Decker talked about early, uh, earlier is that we repurposed the Save A Lot building um, into the new Senior Senior Center. Uh, so I think we have to explore what we can use um, as, as a community service building. Um, but outside of that, in the private sector, I think we have to, um, I know I'm going to sound like a broken clock here, but I think we definitely have to address affordable housing uh, and also transportation because um, obviously if you're going to move to this city, you're going to need workers. And obviously we already have vacant, um, a lot of vacant jobs that aren't being addressed. So um, I think we have to first and foremost uh, address our housing shortage. And I think we also have to address transportation. Uh, we've we've seen a, a transportation shortage in our bus drivers, which means that we have to reduce our services, which means that people who do not have cars have a harder time getting around. Um, so I think if we if we address address some of the underlying issues that would drive businesses up, uh, more more businesses will be likely to enter into some of those uh, vacant buildings. I know in our shop co, uh, we have uh, Hobby Lobby coming in, so that's that's great. But um, I think if we want to make it more of attractive, we have to address uh, housing and, and transportation in the city. And Betty. And I agree with um, Dean and Andre both. Uh, I think that it's a multi-tiered issue. Unfortunately, because they are privately, some of these buildings are privately held, we can't do a whole lot to force the owners to do something. But I would like to see some of these standing buildings be repurposed into something that would be beneficial for the residents here. Um, but and. You know, I, again, I think our biggest issue with housing being a problem, how are we supposed to, you know, address, well, what can we do with this building? We've got to have the people living here first, you know, and as Andre said, with transportation, that's also important. We have to make sure that we have the facilities and the services that people would need in order to be able to do something or encourage the owners of these buildings to allow us to do something to improve them. How can Sheboygan attract and retain young talent, and how can we retain and service companies that we that want to expand? Um, and we'll start with Andre. You asked the right person. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think um, again, we, we like I said, I'm going to sound like a broken clock. We have to address affordable housing, but I think for me, uh, the main reason why I moved to Sheboygan was that uh, there was there was a very affordable living standards and, and housing. Uh, so it made it a very attractive place to live. Um, but I think we also have to address some of the things that keep people here. So obviously um, not everyone wants to drive 45, to, 45 minutes to an hour to Milwaukee. So I think we have to address some of the entertainment issues. Uh, I think we have to kind of explore uh, different business ventures with bars uh, and entertainment that, that young people would like and enjoy. And again, I think we have to address transportation. Um, more and more people in my generation, are, they, we enjoy taking public transportation, whether that's a taxi, that's Uber, or, or the bus services. So I think if we address uh, housing, businesses, and, and transportation, more people like myself uh, will, will come here and also stay here. Um, but I think strategically, uh, the city of Sheboygan is in a good place because we're not too far from Green Bay and Milwaukee. So I think that's attractive in itself. Um, but also continue to, to, to develop our downtown, as we talked about earlier, because um, our lakeshore is, a, is an amazing place to hang out in the summer. Um, so yeah, I think we have to address some of those issues, but also make, make sure we maintain the things that are great about the city right now. Betty? I'm sorry, I keep shutting it off. Um, I think that we have to, um, we have to consider uh, the, the options that we have available now, we need to continue to grow businesses by enticing them here, by offering good wages, by offering great places to live. Um, we have this affordable housing problem still. And I feel like I'm a broken record myself because I keep saying, you know, we have to fix this 
affordable housing problem, if we're gonna attract businesses here, we have to show them why Sheboygan is such a great place to live, work, and play. We have to stand behind what we're saying. You know, we say it's so great, so we have to, um, you know, off, we have to think about fiscally responsible ways to entice businesses here so that we can get the young folks to come here and stay here. So I just, I feel like I'm a broken record with this because, you know, I keep saying the kids are moving away, but it's partly because of affordable housing, partly because of wage issues. We just, we don't have employers that are paying enough of a, a wage that these kids can stay, you know, with affordable housing. So it's just, which is first chicken or the egg. And Dean. This is what I hate being on the end because I really, uh, Betty and, <laughs> and Andrea, it is, it is it's, a, it's affordable housing, it's good jobs, you, you, you know, if, you have, if they have good jobs and are good attractive jobs, I think those are, you know, enter, uh, good entertainment venues that, you know, young people like, you know, be able to go to, a, you know, dance clubs and things like that, and you have to have those kind of uh, venues available. Uh, one thing that they didn't maybe admit is, um, uh, and we are working on this, I think some of the people, uh, this is a young and old thing, but I think a lot of it is uh, the bike trails and that. I think we, we, we need to continue to uh, extend what we have as far as bike trails. I think that's really important. I mean, uh, I think the, the, the community likes them. The, the, and like I said, that's a young, a young and old, but I think it is you know, a young, attractive thing too. Uh, you said I think there are a lot, a lot more younger people are more inclined to bike than what uh, my generation probably did in the past, but now a lot of people in my generation are. Um, I, I think that, um, he said, retaining, uh, bring, bringing in new businesses, bringing in, you know, uh, businesses into our, our business park yeah, is key uh, to bringing in young, uh, so bringing in those good jobs to bringing in those young people. How can the city reduce the number of people experiencing homelessness and what can be done to assist these people? And we'll start with Dean on this one. Um, to reduce homelessness, um, I think we, uh, that's, that's a, one of the, I think the keys is, is uh, the mental health services. I think that's a, a, a big, big portion of, of, of the homeless population is, is mental health services. And I think we need to work, and this is somewhat not necessarily, uh, I hate to kick it to the to the county, but I think it's it's kind of a county-run thing a little bit, I mean, <laughs> because it, it really is. I, the, the county is kind of in charge of our mental health services, and uh, I, I think we need to work with the county. It's not just, it, it's gotta be a partnership with the county, and work with the county board, and work with the uh, county health and human services um, to address the, uh, the needs of it. Um, I, I think that that's probably the, the best answer that I can give is, is that we, we need to, to partner more. I know that with the, um, this, uh, we're looking at with like even with the police department having mental health services working with them because I think that's uh, a big portion of what the, the, uh, the homeless population uh, comes from, I think. And Andre? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely uh, reflect with all the Decker said. Uh, we have to definitely address the mental health services um, in the city, but I, I would definitely be open to having a study about uh, the underlying issues that are driving homelessness in the city. Um, and then I would think we can work with our um, city planning commissions and, and development uh, departments on uh, how to get those services out. Because um, I know we offer a lot of services through, uh, through HUD, uh, that, that actually have services on how to get into housing, how to get um, get into any shelters that they might see or any um, public services when it comes to uh, budget, learning how to budget your finances. So uh, yeah, I don't have too much to add there. I think we definitely have to address the underlying issues with mental health and also uh, alcoholism or drug addiction. I think those are probably some of the driving forces why uh, people are, are homeless. Uh, so I think if we address those, uh, we can definitely reduce the the homelessness issue, but definitely working with our department heads on um, making sure that the people know where to find the services um, in order to find those services so that they're not still on the streets. And Betty. Okay, so I think that this is a multi-tiered approach. Obviously, we do need to work with the County Health and Human Services. We need to work with the County Board Supervisors. But in addition to that, we should also be looking at working with the nonprofits that are working in our city tirelessly to help with the mental health issues with addiction. Um, all of those issues can be underlying factors for homelessness. 
Um, so one of the things we need to do is instead of just looking at, okay, so what can the government do to help me? We need to get out. We need to educate people. We need to um, work with the nonprofits that are already in the trenches. Find out how we can support them. What can we do to assist them? Because they're already there. They're already doing the work. So we need to find ways to build those relationships between the city, the county, and these nonprofits that are already doing this work to reduce the homelessness population problem. Um, I do think that, you know, um, having the, a social worker that's coming along with the police department is a great first step in addressing the mental health problems that we have in the community. Um, so I think that this is a group effort, as everything is. We all have to work together to um, address how we can help people the most. But I do think that we should be supporting the nonprofits that already have the experience, that have the staff, that have the volunteers that are already doing the work. Um, what are the greatest assets of the city, city of Sheboygan and how would you build upon them? Um, and we will start with Betty. Our greatest, our greatest asset is our people. If we didn't have these wonderful folks that are already living here, we wouldn't have very much. Um, we have a great base to start with. We just need to keep building upon what we've already started. We've got the momentum to keep making Sheboygan grow and making it a great place, but we've really got to focus on the issues of maintaining fiscal responsibility, public safety, and you know, affordable housing and employment that is appropriate um, for this area. We need to continue to attract businesses here. You know, all, it all boils down to those main points. So we just, we have to work together. And I think that one of the best ways that we can do that is by becoming involved. Dean? I think one of our greatest assets is, you know, it is the people of Sheboygan, the, uh, the, the population itself, the people of Sheboygan. The also, one of the, the greatest is that great lake right there. That's one of our greatest assets, and we, we need to continue to um, promote uh, the tourism for the things that are, are there. I think that that's, that, that's, that's a key. I, I think that's, you know, we, we've got, I mean, I, I, um, I, I think a lot of people, when they come to see Sheboygan for the first time and they come and look out on the lake and they just, you, you, it, they just are in awe a lot of times. And I think that we need to, uh, to really promote that as much as we have. We can, we have in the past, and I think we need to continue that. Um, I think the people of Sheboygan, um, I think, uh, as Betty said, are, are also a great asset. I think the people of Sheboygan, we're, we're a hardworking community, we're, um, we're, we're driven, but we're a friendly community. We're, we, I, I believe we're a welcoming community. And uh, I think that those are the, you know, the two biggest assets that we have. Uh, we, uh, we have many more, but I think those are the, the, the driving forces behind. And Andre. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all sounding a little bit alike right here. The people, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's what continue to uh, make me want to stay in the city. I continue to be impressed with the community. They're embracing of new people, and they definitely uh, adopt, adopt newcomers very well, so I appreciate that. So to build upon that, I think we just have to continue to support the, the taxpayers and the citizens. Uh, Obviously, we just we're, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and continuing to support them uh, through this pandemic is huge. Uh, I think also the second great asset we have is obviously the lakeshore. It's beautiful all year round and a great place to take the family in the summer. It's also a really great a tourist attraction. And I think some of the, the work we're doing to make sure we protect uh, against lakeshore erosion is, is, very, is a very important uh, task that we need to continue to work on to make sure that we retain this uh, important, important uh, lake shore. Um, and last, I would, I would have to say our, our small local businesses. We have some of the, the best family-owned businesses around, and they provide excellent services and work opportunities in Sheboygan. Um, yeah, and they have some really great food, so uh, that's just a little add-on there. So yeah, I would, I would have to reflect <laughs> what, what my colleagues have said, but I'm at, it, at those uh, three points. Okay. Um, the city is struggling in attracting businesses to the new business park on the south side. What would you do to bring new businesses to that park in Sheboygan? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, that will start with Andre. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think 
It's, it's a pretty simple uh, issue. In order to bring more businesses to Sheboygan, we must take steps to support existing local businesses. Um, once you're supporting the businesses, obviously you're showing that you're willing to support uh, their ongoing um, stay here. Uh, so right now, we, we obviously we've, we've talked about the labor shortage. We have over 3,000 job openings in the city of Sheboygan. So um, again, I, I feel like I'm sounding like a broken clock, but yeah, I think we, we have to address those issues of, um, of affordable housing. Um, and I've, I've recently just had a, a, a conversation with some students and um, even though we have a pretty affordable, um, we have pretty affordable housing here in Sheboygan, it's still not affordable for some people to, to, to um, actually sustain well. So I think we have to look more into the reasons why that is um, and, and address that issue first. Um, and as far as the south side, I think we also have to address um, transportation. We're kind of at, at the tail end of the, of the city, so that means we're kind of wedged in between the town of Wilson. So I think things kind of get a little bit murky about who should be maintaining the roads. Uh, so I think we have to have an a, a ongoing dialogue with the city of Wilson about how we address some of the issues that kind of uh, are, are cross, cross between the two, uh, the town and the city. So I think we have to... Uh, continue to work on those issues of addressing affordable housing, building our relationship with the towns, um, and also addressing uh, transportation. Um, and I think more businesses will, will be likely to come. Um, so, yeah. Betty? So I know that we have a reputation of being a manufacturing town, um, but I do think that as we address the issues with like Andre said, with the affordable housing problem, um, if we can make this place an attractive place, I think that more businesses will come as we have attracted, you know, we have uh, the Shopco building is being used again. You know, we're finding ways to bring businesses here and I think that the more that we have some of these, not only just the unique small businesses, but also bringing some of the larger businesses here, it may attract more businesses to the business park. Um, it's just, it's a real difficult issue, and I think that while we're navigating through a pandemic, businesses are a little bit hesitant to, you know, try out something new because they may risk failure, you know, and so we're having to kind of wait this out, but we do need to find ways to show that we're really attractive, and one of those ways is by keeping businesses here, you know, so. And Dean. Yes, um, I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we've done... Uh, a good job, but, we, 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 uh, but I think the pandemic really did put the brakes on a lot of a, a lot of uh, a lot of projects that people were thinking about, and we, I, or I'm hopeful that some of those ideas come forward again. Um, again, it is it, it, it goes back to what Andre and Betty both said about about the housing, the housing thing. I think we are we as a city are starting to you know, address some of those things. Uh, the purchase of the uh, the large plot of land. Um, uh, just south of Sheboygan uh, will be a great place for us to uh, to, to work forward to. We can uh, be, be able, uh, I think we will be able to because the city does control that land. We control it. We, we can we can kind of determine what kind of housing is going into there. I think because it's not only just getting affordable housing; it's getting a variety of affordable housing. Uh, you want to be able to have, you know, people be able to have single family houses. You want to be able to have apartments, things like that. So you want to be able to give the, give them all those opportunities. And the fact that the, 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 the this plot of land is very close in proximity to the business park um, is, is I think, a, a, a great asset to that because then, you know, it, people, it, it takes care of that transportation problem too. You're, you're not far from work. You can go to work. So, the, you know, the development of that will also, I think, encourage people and encourage businesses because they can look and say, hey, you can build your house right, you know, you're only a couple, you're half a mile away from where you'll be working. Uh, and I think that, that that's uh, one of the, I think, I think we are in the, we're heading in the right direction on that. Um, the city marina has been a financial burden on the taxpayers, contrary to the predictions when it was being built. It is still two to three million dollars in debt, and many of the docks have never been leased. And ice damage is a big cost in severe winters. What is the future of the marina as it continues to struggle? And we'll start with Dean on that. Well, I, I, I 
kind of disagree that it's struggling. I think I, I think it actually I've been very excited. I, I'm on the Marina Parks and Forestry, and the, and the reports from it have been very good. Uh, there have been some damage to the to, 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 to ice damage. That's that's a yearly you know that that, that occurs, but I think that our marina um, with, with the uh, the the uh, um, person that runs it or the, the the organization that runs it now the co company that's taking care of it has been uh, a lot better than what we've had in the past. I think they've done a really good job of promoting it, and I think that they've done a good job of maintaining it. Uh, I think so. Although it may not, it, it did not come out to be as what you know people had hoped for. Uh, I think the projections were a little bit you know, lofty at the time that the, when they when they built the marina. Um, it, there's not something that we're going to go. I, it's not something that we're it, we're not going to go away. It's there. We're not going to abandon it. I think it's it, it's something that we need to continue to support. Yeah, it, it is a it, it is an asset. It's part of that asset of you know when you asked about the asset of of, of what's of this uh, the lake. That's that's the you know the, it's one of our draws, uh, and I think um, it's it's become more of a draw uh, with our marina than it was in the past. So um, I think uh, I think the, I think the future is actually very bright with our marina. Andre. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, first and foremost uh, we have to take a look at what's what's been going wrong and have conversation with the, the people who run the marina and, and see how can we improve uh, and support what they're doing. Um, I would like to, to see if the, the, the pandemic had any effect on what the marina is trying to do. But uh, we, we also have to work with our uh, city administrator, Todd Wolf, who, um, uh, who has been very involved with city planning and, and economics issues. Um, but we're also, as a city, working on the strategic plan, and I'm sure the marina will be a part of that. So I would like to look more into the strategic plan to see how we can improve it and how we can support the marina. Because um, I think it is something that can be an asset to the, to the, to the city uh, in the future. Uh, but I think we just have to see where, where the issues uh, went wrong and how we can improve on them and how can we get it back on, back on, the, on the, the trajectory we want it to uh, be in the first place. <laughs> And Daddy. Well, I feel like I'm going to be echoing what Dean and Andre said here. Um, I do feel like sometimes we, we can come up with a great idea. I think that the marina is a wonderful place, and I think that it should be supported. I think it is a valuable asset. Even if we did fall short of what we had originally planned, that's okay, because we can, we're going to still have it. We still support it. I think that um, the one thing that we can do is you know work together with the city to find the best ways and with the owners to find the best way to promote it, to get more people aware of this fantastic opportunity that's available for use. Um, I think that, you know, if we communication seems to be like my big theme tonight. I keep saying we got to communicate, but I think that it's important that people understand what's available out there and maybe people don't realize. Um, but I think that if we work together with city staff, we can continue to show that it's a fantastic resource and it was not money wasted, it's something that we can continue to grow once we figure out where we've had the losses. Um, and how can the city generate revenue other than increasing property taxes? And we'll start with Betty. All right, so as I always say, I do not believe that we need to keep breaking the backs of citizens by raising property tax. I think that, you know, we need to bring businesses here. We need to bring tourism here. We need to attract people here. We have to show them what a great place this is. You know, and by showing people what we have and increasing that tourism, we're increasing the dollars. If we can attract people to live here um, through affordable housing, you know, people will spend their money here rather than elsewhere. So we want to, and we want to bring businesses here and have well-paying jobs here because that money gets returned into our community. So it's really, we've got to go back to the affordable housing, the employment issues that we have. Dean? Well, I, I would say not the increased tax, but the increased tax base, I think, is the key to, to increasing our, our revenues. I think the key, you know, the increasing tax base, which we have been doing in the with, with some of the apartment complexes that that we we built in. Uh, I think again with the with that affordable housing, also the, those housing, the, you know, even if they're lower uh, lower dollar house, they're still going to be bringing in tax revenue. And we increase the tax base, 
we'll be increasing the tax revenue, or we're increasing the revenue without increasing everyone else's taxes. So um, that's I think that's a key. I, I think some of the new, you know, the new businesses that if we can attract, you know, a, a, a factories and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited, and uh, I just uh, because I believe the uh, school board has uh, approved the the sale to Freightert of the, uh, the 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 land over on Taylor Drive. That's going to be a, a huge tax generator for the city and those kind of things like that are what we need to continue to attract to the city to bring our you know, to, to help us out it's not necessarily increasing taxes it's increasing tax base i think is what we need to be more focused on and andre yeah yeah i would have to agree with all the decker that we have to increase our tax base and i think we can do that by the conversation we were having earlier about uh, making our downtown more attractive uh, make sure we support um, uh, uh, maintenance and, and services on the lake shore because uh, I think the more tourism we have that's one uh, avenue that we have the more people who are coming here to visit the city uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to bring more people to, to visit the city of Sheboygan and that's going to increase the tax base um, but also we just have to uh, continue to support uh, the services um, that are offered right now uh, so yeah I don't have too much more to add to that but um yeah, I think we, we just have to make sure we support the services we have now and increase the tax base overall. Um, that concludes our prepared questions. So thank you all for participating tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.